All right, let's get started. We have a, you know, the holidays. I, don't let it be said that I'm not festive, you know. Here's my, my pun for you today, you know. Get it? Because it's, yeah. You'll take stat 345, you'll get it then. All right. Well, at some point you'll figure it out. All right. Okay. Um, again, I just, mercy of the court, haven't gotten your exams graded yet, but that's my goal this weekend. Um, I thought, though, that given that um, we are getting close to the end, um, I thought I would give you a little bit of a taste of things to come. So here's your schedule tentatively for the next few days, uh, a few lectures. And I want to illustrate a couple of things. So right now, today, we're going to discuss centroids of three-dimensional bodies, which is really not anything conceptually more difficult than anything we've been doing. But I also want to introduce the concept of a moment of inertia. Um, if the centroid utilizes the first moment of area, the moment of inertia is the second moment of area. So it's a natural discussion point. Um, what we are then going to do is close out the semester with two topics. The first topic is structural analysis. And the, the, the two types of structural analysis that we are going to perform is the analysis of trusses and the construction of shear and moment diagrams. Uh, and centroids and structural analysis is what is going to be comprised on your third exam. Um, your final is going to be comprehensive, but it is going to have an additional topic, which is friction. Um, so what we're going to do is I want to cover structural analysis up through this day. And what I did last semester is friction is very, very uh, short. It's, there's not a lot of additional material. And I was able to cover friction with just one lecture last year. But I want to make sure that it has its due uh, light under the sun. Matt, I will call you later. Yeah, he's our assistant dean for student affairs. I want, what? What? <laughs> I've known Matt for about 20 years. I went to high school with Matt, so long story, or short story, I guess. Um, okay, uh, last semester, last year, I did friction in a single lecture. I'd like to give it its due time under the sun. So since I ran out of the slides uh, of the, the, this table, I didn't want it to be too big. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do centroids today. Our structural analysis is going to comprise the rest of what we do uh, for the next couple weeks. Um, Monday, the week before Thanksgiving break, we're going to have our exam review. Wednesday, we're going to have our third exam. And we're on time. We're not behind. So I had in the syllabus that this was a makeup day. Makeup day means we need to make up lost time, but we're not behind. We're ahead, uh, if anything. So you know what we're going to do? We're not going to have class Friday before Thanksgiving break, unless you're so excited about statics that we can start. <laughs> You don't have to be that happy about not being around me. I mean, why would you want to cancel a celebration of learning? Come on now. I mean, to like January after the semester's over? All right. Okay. All right. We got to get to it. Let's talk about centroids. So, is it not working? All right, let's just do it that way. Okay, so we're dealing with the concept of a centroid, and if I wanted to summarize the, the centroid concept in, in, a, in a nutshell, it is really a weighted average coordinate of a body in question. Whether we're talking about that average in terms of weights or in terms of geometry, it's the same process. We can take the sum of x times the weights divided by the sum of the weights, we can take the sum of x times the areas divided by the sum of the areas. 
we learned last time that we could take the sum of x times the lengths of one-dimensional line segments divided by the sum of those lengths to determine the centroid of a skeletal structure like a truss or a crane or something like that. Again, the, the concept is the same. So if I take this process uh, and, and extend it into the third dimension, it really shouldn't be any different. Now, one of the things I'll go ahead and tell you is that we're actually going to use these for 3D analysis as well. A lot of times what we deal with in three-dimensional applications in engineering are, are essentially extrusions. So what I mean by that is, you know, we have, let's say, for example, an I-beam. An I-beam is just a two-dimensional shape that's been extruded or some sort of bracket or some sort of plate. And so since you're dealing with two-dimensional objects that have been extruded, you can still use these uh, in a pretty straightforward fashion. Um, sometimes we need uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, references for centroids because sometimes this isn't enough. So, for example, if you're designing a part and you have, let's say, some sort of hemispherical region and you need to know, okay, where is the centroid of this shape? Well, it, you know, we know where the Y and the Z bar are because it's a circle. It's like right there. But how far out inside the shape do we hit the centroid? Well, that's what these references are for. Again, same idea. We're actually not going to use any today for the part that we're looking at, nor will you need any for the homework assignment. But I, again, I don't think you're going to find this is all that challenging. Um, this is the problem that we're going to do. We're going to determine the centroid of this particular shape. And I'll go ahead and tell you, we're probably not going to do go through the rote process of calculating all of them, but you'll see what I mean. So I have here this like machine part, and it's a weird geometry, but that weird geometry is comprised of several components that are not so weird. We have rectangles and circles and quarter circles and so on and so forth. And so what we're going to do is compute the location of the centroid referenced from this particular coordinate system right here. Okay. So uh, the big thing to keep in mind is that this is a bookkeeping problem, just like all the other problems that we've been doing. Now, I think what makes um, centroids uh, three-dimensional regions maybe a little different is the big, uh, the big thing to watch out for is double, sorry, double counting regions. <clears throat> so for example, if I look at this bracket here, okay, I have a rectangular region right here, and I have this you know, sort of quarter, semi, uh, quarter circle region here. This part right there, where the two regions intersect when we're uh, summing up our volumes and determining centroidal distances, we got to make sure we don't overlap and double count that region, okay? Because there's only one component there. So as long as your bookkeeping is done well, th this isn't any more difficult than anything that we've done before. So, all right, I'm going to copy this image because I'm going to use it a couple times. I had to go out of town yesterday. In fact, I was in an airport uh, quite a bit, and I had some flight delays. So between flight delays and all that, I did not mu get much sleep, so I am pretty dog tired. But then again, given the holiday, it's probably appropriate, I feel like, a zombie. Okay. Extended Halloween joke. Man, y'all are a tough crowd today. Maybe it's because it's so gloomy out. Okay. So here's our shape. Um, we have sort of, uh, I guess, four regions to consider. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider this rectangular prism region right here, and we'll call that object number one. Object number two is we'll consider this uh, quarter circular region here. And then objects three and four are going to be the holes. So there, remember, when you have holes in two dimensions, we consider those with negative area. So this is just going to be regions with negative volume. So no different in terms of how we handle it. So let's move this over here. Make that a little bigger. Let's call this shape one. And shape one, we'll call this this rectangular prism. And so that everybody's clear on what I'm talking about, I'm talking about this region right here. So
So I'm cutting that off right here. So this is going to be my, my, uh, my rectangular prism. So the, the quarter circular region right here can't go all the way back to here. I can't double count that. So we just got to be real careful in terms of the dimensions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw this red region sort of over here. You know, what would really make the YouTube video interesting today is if I just randomly during the example grabbed the mic and went, boo. I would never do that. You know the folks who are watching the video now are now going to be apprehensive for the rest of the lecture. Okay. So, all right. Here's the, uh, here's the coordinate system. And what I did is I made it a point uh, to indicate where the origin is because we need to construct not just our volumes, but the X and Y and Z coordinates of the centroid of this region. So the centroid, we're going to say, is like right here. You know, something like that. That's where the centroid is. We're going to see if we can figure that out. Now, what is that thickness for this uh, particular plate? Half inch, yeah. You have 0.5 inches. Okay, what is this dimension right here? Four and a half inches. And what is this dimension right here? Two inches. Does everybody see why that's two inches? Because this is a circular region with a radius of two. So that's two, and that's two as well. OK? So I propose that the volume of object number one is 4.5 inches times 2 inches times 0 0.5 inches, which 2 times a half is 1. And one times anything is itself, so 4.5 cubic inches. So far, so good? OK. All right. Now, what we also need to do is locate the x, y, and z of where this point is. So in other words, I want the x, y, and z for this. Let me erase the little coordinate system there because I think that's probably actually making it more complicated. All right, so what is x1? How far along the x-axis do I have to travel to get to the center of that prism? 0.25, right? Positive because we're going positive along the x-axis. Is everybody okay with that? All right. What about y? Negative 1 because we're going down and z. I missed a, a joke there. What was z? Is that positive or negative? Okay. I feel left out of all the humor today. It's okay. All right. Is everybody with me on this? Okay. Does anybody have any questions? All right. What we're going to do now is we're going to repeat this, and we're going to use a different region. We're now going to look at a different region. So uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit, copy, I'll, uh, that's kind of bigger, so let me, that goes here, all right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to do shape number two, and shape number two, I'm going to call this quarter circular region.
OK. Now, for this quarter circular region, what I'm focusing on is, now let's pay attention, what we can't do is overlap the rectangular prism. The prism was this entire chunk. So imagine samurai sorting and all of this. So the quarter circular region is just this. That's the region that we're looking at, that part right there. So if I draw that out, and oh, goodness, my art. This is going to be crazy. Please do not judge my limited artistic abilities. That's the best you're going to get. All right, this is the region that we're considering. And again, we're doing that because this part here was considered on the rectangular prism. I also need to make sure that I'm accurately locating where the coordinate system is. The coordinate system is backed off a little bit right there. So that needs to be about like that. Okay, so that's X, that's Y, that's Z. Let's start off with the volume. Can anybody help me out in determining the volume of this region? Well, here's an easier way of thinking about it. I propose that the volume is simply the area of this quarter circle times the thickness, right? So what is the area of this quarter circular region? How would I determine the area of that? No, not not. A, you said a fourth of pi times four squared, or is it a pi times? Pi times squared. There you go. So, the area of a circle is pi r squared. We're going to take that pi r squared. We're going to divide it by four. Then we're going to multiply it times the thickness. Hold on, I can do better than that. So pi two inches squared times the thickness divided by 4. So, anybody got an answer for me on that with your Casio FX 115ES plus or similar scientific calculator? We'll say like three decimal places. Pi over 2, which is, come on, we're engineers. There we go, 1.571 cubic inches, okay? And so, why did I say shape, though? No, that's not subscript 1, that's subscript 2. That's volume 2. So now, what I also need is an X2, a Y2, and a Z2. You can see this is why I put a line through my Zs, because my Zs and my 2s look exactly the same. Okay. Let's start off simple. Let's start off with Z. What is Z going to be for this shape? Remember, on our diagram up here, this dimension is 0 0.5 inches, and this dimension here is 2 inches. So what is Z? This one's easy. 0 0.25 inches. 0 0.25 inches. It's just half the thickness. Now what we're going to do, we're going to do Y. Okay? Now, what we would have to do is look up our centroid reference because we'd have to figure out where is the centroid of a quarter circle. Okay? Now I'm going to put that down here for you because it's in your book, but... I'll just give you that. So here's a quarter circle. Here's the centroid. And we'll say this distance here is X bar. And this distance here is Y bar. 
I propose that x bar equals y bar equals 4r over 3 pi. Which, that shouldn't be all that surprising since we've done quarter circular regions before. Oh, oh I can have it. So, help me out with y2. Let, let's, let's just keep it like this. Is y2 going to be positive or negative? Negative. So y2 is going to be negative 4r over 3 pi, which is negative 4, 2 inches over 3, come on, 3 pi, which is what? We'll say like three decimal places. Negative 0 0.849. Do I have a second on that? Okay, good. Now, if y2 is negative, is x2 positive? Because it's going along the positive x-axis, right? So that means positive 4r over 3 pi, right? What he said is exactly correct. Look at where the semicircle is. The corner of that semicircular region is not resting on the origin. Remember, look over here, right? The origin is right here. But the shape in question is shifted out by one thickness. This is where we didn't overlap. So what we have to do is add 0 0.5 inches. Does everybody see that? That's, that's kind of important that you see that that semicircular region is shifted out one. Okay? Everybody good with that? So instead of being 0.849, it's going to be 1.349. All right. Sound good? Okay. All right, if you're okay with that, then I think that the holes are pretty easy. So... We can handle those together. First off, the volume is equal, okay, for both of these. We were also told that the diameter was one inch for these holes. So if the diameter is one inch, what's the radius? Half inch. So I propose that the area of these circles is pi r squared times the thickness will give me the volume. So pi r, pi r, pi r squared times the thickness. Am I missing something in that formula? Negative. It's a hole. These volumes are negative. So, we're looking at essentially half of pi, negative 1.571 cubic inches. As for the x and y and z coordinates, I think we can probably eyeball this. We'll call this right here hole 3, this one hole 4. That's supposed to be three. Did yeah, did I screw something up? Wait, did I did I mess something up? Yeah, oh, whoops, you're exactly right. This is supposed to be a half. Yeah, I wrote down the wrong volume. This is wrong. What'd you get? Yeah, I wrote down the wrong one. This must be negative 0 0.393. Is that what you're asking? Yes. I, I'm sorry, you're exactly correct.
Exactly right. Sorry about that. Yeah, if the diameter is one inch, the radius is a half inch. Okay, for the X, Y, and Z coordinates for these uh, holes, I propose that the X coordinate is going to be the same because the center of both of these holes is still a quarter of an inch. It's still 0 0.25 inches for both of them. And Y is also the same because they're both down uh, along the y-axis at the same spot. Here's the y-axis, here's the y-axis, and they both go down a value of 1. So they're both negative 1. What changes is the fact that along the z-axis, this hole is here and this hole is here. So if this is hole 3, z3 is what? 1.5. That's exactly right because this distance is 1, right? But we have to come out another half inch, right? Half inch 1, half inch 3. So this is 1.5 inches, and this is 3.5 inches. D does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right, so far so good? So here's the thing. We have all of the data necessary to compute the centroid. What I am, what happened there? Um, what I am not going to do is sit here and do all of them. I don't think there's much value in that, but I'll do one of them just so you can kind of see what we're going to do here. So um, let's compute... centroid centroid along and let's just pick one let's just do the z-axis so what we're basically saying so the z-axis sorry the z-axis is the sum of z times the volume divided by the sum of the volumes that's what we're doing, okay? We could do all of them. It wouldn't matter. I'm just doing one because at some point the problem starts getting a little repetitive and I'd like to talk about other stuff. So we have four shapes. We need the volumes. So what did we have? We had the volume of shape one was 4.5, shape 2 was 1.571, and shape 3 and 4 were negative 0 0.393. So our algorithm dictates that we do need the sum of the volumes, so sum these values up and you end up getting something like 5, Point, uh, 0.285, and then what we'll do now is we will list the z values, z1, z2, z3, and z4, so we got 2.25, 0 0.25, 1 1.5, and 3.5. So we've got the sum of the volumes. Our algorithm dictates that we need the sum of z times the volume. So we need a z v value for each of these. And if the volume's in cubic inches, z is in inches, this will be in inches to the fourth. Okay? So I know it's, it seems like a weird unit, like are we entering the fourth dimension? No, it's just a volume times a moment arm. So, okay. Um, so 4.5 times 2.25, you end up getting 10.125. Here you end up getting 0 0.393. These two terms are negative because the volumes are negative. All right, I'm just, I, I, hopefully this is kind of rote at this point. I'm not, am I going through this too fast? Is everybody okay with this? Okay. And then we sum these up, 
And so when you sum these up, you get 8.554. So therefore, Z bar is 8.544. To the four inches to the fourth divided by 5.285 inches to the third. And when you chug that out, you get Z is 1.62 inches. Okay, we'll stop. Uh, we're not done because I want to talk about moments of inertia. But um, is everybody okay with this example? So what we're doing here is computing the centroid along the, uh, the z-axis. If we wanted the full definition, x comma y comma z, we would do this with the y distances, do this with the x distances, but it'd be pretty repetitive, right? It'd be the same thing. It wouldn't be hard. You know, I think the hardest part is just collating the values, you know, uh, categorizing the X, Y, and Z for each of the shapes and the volumes of the shapes. Once you got that, you're rocking and rolling, okay? Right. Any questions? Can we leave this up here for a sec? All right. Everybody good? All right. Let's talk about moments of inertia, okay? I want you to kind of understand why we're talking about this. I don't need a math formula thing. Okay. I want you to, uh, I want to talk about this concept of a moment of area. I, I, uh, I mentioned this last time. Um, this is going to be sort of where we terminate our discussion on centroids. So first off, centroids are done. We're finished with that. Moments of inertia, though, are an extension of centroids, like you need to know how to locate the centroid in order to compute a moment of inertia of a composite shape. But I want to recall some moments of area concepts. Everybody pay attention, watch this. So if I integrate a function from some range from A to B, that will tell me the area under the curve, right? But if I integrate x times that function along some range. I do not get the area. I get what's called the first moment of area because I'm taking that area and multiplying it by a single distance, by a moment arm x. If I integrate again, or I integrate with uh, multiplying by x again, this would be the second moment of area. And you could get crazy with this. You could say that the 35th moment of area is the integral of x to the 35th times your function, right? But there's a point when, like, what's the point? Like, wh why are you doing this? Okay? Well, let's go back to why we're doing this in general. I mean, knowing the area of a region is just a fundamental problem of calculus. And so, like, we obviously know why that's important. And I think hopefully by now you recognize why this integral is important. Because if I take this integral and divide it by that, that tells me where the, the centroid is. Right? That's the whole point. Right? So what about this one? Why is this important? This uh, uh, integral has a special name all on itself. It's the second moment of area, but we have a special name for it. We call it the area moment of inertia. And sometimes we just call it the, air, uh, the moment of inertia. Uh, in dynamics land next semester, you'll learn about uh, moments of inertia as well as mass moments of inertia. But for, for us, we're just looking at area moments of inertia uh, in here. Moments of inertia have a very, very profound impact on structural response. And I'm sure. Some of the mechanicals and biomedicals are thinking, oh, God, here Dr. Mike goes talking about bridges. Um, who cares? But this is really just important for engineering in general. It doesn't matter if you're a mechanical engineer or biomedical engineer. This is important, period. Okay? Um, I, I have a, a pretty visceral example with, with something I think you probably got some familiarity with uh, to kind of explain. But an easy way to understand moments of inertia is to consider this. Okay? So this is... a, a, a pretty basic like patio structure, okay? Now what you're seeing here is, uh, so here's a, like a little patio area out in somebody's backyard. So you can see they dug some, uh, uh, some, some footings out, some, some circular uh, foundations. So they 
dug out, poured some, uh, some concrete and whatnot, and you can see these supports. And so what you're seeing here is the frame that's going to support the floor system for this given patio. Now, notice how, so these elements that are going this way, like here, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, and they're going along this longitudinal direction. See how they're facing? See how they're sort of facing like this, where the long way is facing up, as opposed to, like, why are they doing that? Why are they facing them up this way as opposed to this way, okay? Well, I think common sense would tell you that along that direction, the, they're stiffer, right? How many of you have a ruler? Does anybody have a ruler with them? Anybody? I'm curious. Does anybody have a ruler with them? All right, let me see this ruler. I have a scale. What do you want? I need a ruler, not a scale. They have a, ah, there we go. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Mastrangelo. Okay, so here's a ruler. I promise not to break it. Okay, so... <laughs> let me show you something. Everybody pay attention. Watch this. I, I will not break it, I promise. But let me show you something, okay? Here's this ruler, okay? Now watch this. Everybody watch. Everybody pay attention. Right, here's this ruler. I'm going to take this ruler, and I'm going to bend it this way. See how I'm able to flex it pretty easily? Okay? Now let's take it and turn it 90 degrees and do the same thing. I can't generate that level of deformation, whereas this way it's pretty easy. Do you see that? If you have some money to buy a new ruler, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Here you go. I told you I wouldn't break it. But there is a reason for that. There's a, there is a reason why I am able to easily deform that element along, the, along one axis, but as soon as I turn it, it becomes much stiffer. Okay? The reason is that because if I compute the area moment of inertia oriented one way versus another, you will find that the area moment of inertia is much larger if the shape is oriented this way as opposed to oriented this way. And the area moment of inertia has a profound impact on flexural response. I don't care if you're a civil engineer, mechanical engineer, biomedical engineer, just about every system that we design as engineers has something in it that's being bent, just period, okay? Uh, and the way that we most easily categorize flexural stiffness is by the computation of a moment of inertia. Um, for simple shapes or shapes with symmetry, you can easily determine um, along which axis should you orientate the member. So for instance, on these two by fours that have, or these, these aren't two by fours, these are more like two by twelves. For these two by twelves, it's pretty easy to assess uh, which direction you should orientate them because they exhibit symmetry. For shapes that do not exhibit symmetry, you can, and, and this will be a topic maybe next semester when you take Engineering 216, but we can actually determine the best orientation to generate the most stiffness and simultaneously the worst orientation. Uh, and sometimes engineers need to know both, right? Because we want to know sometimes best and worst case scenarios. Um, but yeah, the reason for the, uh, the difference in behavior is because of that moment of inertia. Now, how do you determine, how do you compute the moment of inertia? Well, two ways. First off, there's the, uh, the what I would call the, the mathematical approach. Do you remember this problem that we recorded, we did the recording of? Right, so remember, we integrated x squared from 0 to 3 to get the area. You could integrate x times x squared to get the first moment. What you could also do is integrate x squared times this function to get the second moment. So, it, you know, I could probably do this right here on the screen instead of jumping to a, uh, uh, jumping to a, to a, uh, a slide. So, the other thing that you have to be sort of a little bit careful of is on notation. So, for example, area is the integral of the region. If I integrate x times the region, I am computing the first moment of area, which we usually refer to as Q, about the y-axis, because the idea is my moment arm is x. x is how far away you are from this vertical line. And that vertical line is the y-axis, hence the flip. So if I want to determine, say, the moment of inertia about the y-axis, I would integrate x squared, right? But that's pretty easy, because all I'm doing is integrating x squared 
times the original function from 0 to 3. And boom, there's the moment of inertia about the y-axis. Okay. Uh, what I could then do is say, okay, what about the moment of inertia about the x-axis? So do that rectangle flipping thing and uh, uh, recompute. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you do that. Okay. Don't worry. I'm not going to make you go through and do the flipping rectangle and do the integration again. I'm not going to make you do that. I think by now you kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. Everybody with me so far? All right. What we are going to do uh, starting next time is I'm going to show you the algorithm for computing the moment of inertia of a composite shape. And just like the algorithm for computing the centroid of a composite shape, it is very tabular in nature, right? You take the, the process, you split, you take the shape, you split it up into a bunch of simple shapes, and you say, okay, what's the area of each shape? What's the x distance for each shape? Area times x, divide the sums, boom, you get the centroid, right? There is a simple extension to that algorithm that you can then use to compute the moment of inertia. The extension of that algorithm is what's called the parallel axis theorem. That is going to be the whole subject of the next lecture. I'm not going to make you do any of these derivations like this, so don't worry, but I am going to make you do the algorithm. We don't have time to discuss the algorithm today anyways, so um, we'll do that on, uh, uh, on Monday. So for that, all I will say is you do seem maybe a little old for trick-or-treating, but hopefully you'll have a relaxing weekend, uh, and I will see you all on Monday.